there was never really a need to change cookware. And I'm cool with cooking on the stuff that my great, great grandparents cooked on sure. in, you know, the late 1800s and inspiring people to do that and to share love and to show people that it's not hard to cook good stuff. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what Cast Iron Kyle is. The New Jersey Innovation Institute is the conduit that connects one of the nation's leading polytechnic institutions, New Jersey Institute of Technology, to the outside world. Created to leverage the vast resources of NJIT, the New Jersey Innovation Institute is focused on fostering innovation, building companies, and upskilling New Jersey's workforce. NJI employs over 100 people and generates over $35 million in revenue per year in industries such as defense and healthcare. To learn more about the innovative strides being taken at the New Jersey Innovation Institute, head to njii.com. Entrepreneurs and small business owners, are you feeling overwhelmed by lack of capital, growth challenges, or personal branding? You are not alone. UCS Advisors is here for you. We're professional capital raising advisors committed to helping you secure funding and grow your business. Are you ready to impress investors? Check your investor readiness with our free 45-second quiz at ucsquiz.com. We believe in you. Visit ucsquiz.com and start your success journey. And remember, always be willing to achieve your greatness. What's everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. <clears throat> I'm your host, Mike Ham. We're here in Trenton, New Jersey. Our first episode actually in Trenton, New Jersey ever, which is kind of surprising, but also not really that surprising. But we're with Kyle Seif, Cast Iron Kyle. Cast Iron Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, happy to be here in your home. I'm really pumped to talk to you because you're a Jersey guy. Absolutely. Right? So we're yes. going to talk a lot about that kind of stuff, but also... Uh, we love when interesting people reach out to me first. And right. so like you, you followed us and then I started getting into like what you do with your stuff and with cast iron, like all the other things that you're doing with your accounts. And I was like, this is pretty cool. And definitely something that's like super unique for what, uh, the types of guests that we've had on the show, which at this point is this episode 114. Wow. So we've done a, we've done a lot. So a lot of people, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, okay. I want to, let's learn a little bit about you. Uh, so, We'll do a little bit quick 30,000 foot view, what Cast Iron Kyle is, okay. and then we'll kind of like get into how you got to here. Well, I mean, it's oh, oh, what, what Cast Iron Kyle actually is, is to teach people how to, you know, essentially share the love of cooking to, to share emotions. Um, I mean, it's no, no secret that men aren't really good at sharing emotions. Um, so kind of true. Embracing uh, having emotions is kind of tough for men to do sometimes. So I've found that it's a really great way to show love for people. Yeah. Uh, you might not find the right, right words to say, you might not find the right gift or the right expression, but if you're good at cooking and you can make a meal for somebody, if they're, you know, your girl's having a bad day, she comes in and be like, here's, I made this for you. I yeah. made, or I'm hungry before bed. You could throw together a way better quesadilla and some cast iron with a little <laughs> knowledge than, yeah. you know, oh, we'll order out real quick. You know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's not just the food itself. It's the level of love and passion that you put into the meals that you're sharing with people. So I feel like teaching people to cook in cast iron is not only healthy, and I'm a big fan of if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. So there was never really a need to change cookware. And I'm cool with cooking on the stuff that my great, great grandparents cooked on sure. in you know the late 1800s. And inspiring people to do that and to share love and to show people that it's not hard to cook good stuff. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what Cast Iron Kyle is. Okay. But also the element of um, that personal element, I like to add that. Uh, I, I try to use that element to stand out from other people that are doing the same thing. Like there's a lot of guys that are doing great work in the cast iron world. But when you approach their social media... It's just pictures of skillets and skillets and skillets and skillets and who is this? Who is this? I forget who I'm looking at. Yeah. You look at mine. I'm going to cook a you know a lamb rack and then you're going to see a video of my dog and cat fighting. You know what I mean? Like I want people to know <laughs> yeah. that I'm an approachable guy. Yeah. Like I want people to reach out with questions. My biggest thing is don't. There's no stupid questions. Right. I once asked in a room full of horse people how many litters are uh, how many ponies are in a litter. <laughs> so I've I've been on the other end of those yeah. that, those questions. Totally. So I want people to know they can reach out. And ninety yeah. percent of my sales are people actually reaching out to me saying, 
a size eight is 11 inches. I, I, I want a size not, you know, like they, I, I want people to know that they can talk to me and ask yeah. questions. Right. And 90% of my sales aren't even things I post. It's people coming to me, telling me what they're looking for. And I have it in inventory yeah. and send it out. That's cool. Um, so there's so much that you just talked about that I want to talk about, but we have to follow some sort of <laughs> process here, <laughs> but I just, it's I, a big answer. I have so many questions is bubbling up already, but I, I do, let's just start. Cause I'm interested to see how you got from like early days Kyle. Okay. To starting with the cast iron stuff and showing love by cooking in a cast iron skillet. So, right. um, you're born and raised Jersey guy. Absolutely. Right? Allentown, New Jersey. Allentown, New Jersey. That, that's this area, right? Yeah. It's about five, six miles okay. that way. All right. That way. And so yeah, <laughs> over there, oh, no, right. yeah. Camera two. Yeah. Uh, over yeah. that way. Um, and so what were you doing? Like what was young Kyle into? Were you cooking back then? Was like yeah. food a big part of your early yeah. life? We uh, we were in 4-H. We were in. I was in FFA. We were in 4-H. We did. Um, I was in Boy Scouts, so cooking outside was always big. Yeah. 4-H. I entered a lot of uh, vegetable growing competitions. Okay. My family owned a farm in Heightstown. My family's from the Jersey side of my family's from Heightstown. Okay. So when you were you know talking to Pie Girl, I was like, I know exactly where that's totally. At. Um, and you know, young me, I, I was always interested in in cooking. It fascinated me that you could take something you know, the couple ingredients, couple, you know, seasonings and spices and turn it into a meal where somebody's like happy. Yeah. So it always intrigued me. Um, I was always into fishing and my dad was a hunter. So we always had, you know, different things to eat in the house. We were always, you know, here's deer meat or here's a mahi mahi when I was like 10 years <laughs> old, you know? Yeah. And, uh, my parents did actually introduce us to some cultural dishes, like my mom's German. So it's like different things that they eat. And my dad, you know, cooked the traditional way they cooked on the farm. And I just, it was just a big part of my life. Yeah. And I spent a lot of my childhood with my paternal grandmother from, uh, she was from Heightstown. She was a big auctioneer. She was antiquer, big into collecting and buying and selling. I would go to auctions with her when I was little and I had to, I'd have to sit on my hands because if you make any kind of gesture, yeah. she's got to buy some art, you know, <laughs> she'll be pissed. Um, that's, that's my go-to line about my grandmother is yeah. I had to sit on my hands so she didn't have to buy some stupid art she didn't want. <laughs> um, but I, I learned like, I've seen that. I've, I've seen people throw something out that looks like that. How yeah. these people are bidden like crazy. And I learned at a young age, like when Pokemon came out, I found oh. out. I can have my own Pokemon card collection, but I can also sell the Pokemon cards I don't want to get more Pokemon cards that I want. Sure. So a little hustler that, back in the day. Dude, totally. We had, How old are you? I'm 35. Okay, so I'm 33. So yeah. we're right in the same, dude, right, you know, yeah. right in the wheelhouse. Um, well, we were little. We, 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 didn't, we didn't grow up, you know, affluent or anything like that. We grew up in a nice middle-class neighborhood. Yeah. Um, we were always trying to think of a new business. I remember uh, my mom had this bicycle. It was made by Schwinn. It was a three-wheeled bicycle with a big, had two wheels in the back, big basket, newspaper delivery bike. We turned that into the come to you car wash. It had yeah. the soap, the spe our special solution of soap and our special rinse bucket. Sure. We would go to people's houses and wash their cars with our own supply. Yeah. And we were like, oh my gosh, now we have money. Now we can get Pokemon cards. Now we can sell more Pokemon <laughs> cards. We have two flows of business. We yeah. were like little entrepreneurs, That's 10, amazing. 12 years old, <laughs> yeah. shoveling driveways, mowing lawns, raking leaves, everything we could to make a couple extra bucks yeah. to be able to have the nicer things in life. And my parents, I didn't ask my parents to buy me Magic the Gathering and Pokemon cards. We had to pay the electric bill. Yeah. You know what I mean? So right. figuring that out at a young age and then being around my grandmother, it just, it just morphed into this buying and selling phase of my, my early twenties where it was just everything. It was antique stuff. It was, you know, vintage shirts and it just became too much. I learned the value of just about everything. Yeah. So the other half of where this all came from, I, I spent a great uh, deal of time with my grandfather on my mom's side. He had Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. all that. And, uh, I lived with him around the clock for five years and cooked for him. I took okay. care of him and he was from Tennessee so you're not going to fool a, a guy raised in Tennessee on some bad food. So yeah. I learned to cook very well to show that love when I should have been out partying, going to college, being a stupid 18, 19 year old kid. Yeah. I was living with my 80 year old grandfather cooking for him. Right. So I kind of keep my, my grandmother, uh, her, her, her memory alive and my grandfather, they were my two favorite people. And to be able to do something that reminds me of both of them every single day. Yeah kind of takes the heat off of losing them. You sure. know what I mean? So it, it's f forgetting that they're gone is like 
sometimes happens, but remembering that they're not there is like super tough. Yeah. So I might have got that backwards. So if you want to reverse that, it might work the same way. <laughs> With the same app. I'm just I'm really into the stone. Yeah. 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 And um yeah. I, I, I enjoy focusing on one realm of you know, the buying and selling, which is the cast iron. I do find some cool stuff along the way. Don't get me wrong. I'm totally. finding, you know, autographed Alex Trebek Fungo Pop here and sure. there. Yeah. And uh, that's fun too. But uh, I learned the value of a dollar very early and I learned how to cook very early and I learned how to flip stuff very early. And it has totally taken over, you know, yeah. to this, what, what you see now. That's really cool. So uh, at what point does the cast iron stuff come into play? Because like we're talking about Pokemon cards. Yeah. Which is, I mean, dude. Pokemon cards. I gave, I gave mine away right. to a friend's little brother Regret, when I was in high school. <laughs> so, yeah, talk about regrets. I like look at it. Every now and then I'll be like, I wonder what a Gengar Japanese. And then I'm like, oh, uh, no, I should stop looking. Shut it off. Yeah. Put it down. I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to bed. Going to bed, yeah. Um, but uh, so, like, I, I would imagine, like, cooking for a grandfather who's from Tennessee and, like, mm-hmm. going antiquing and, like, do all that yeah. kind of stuff. Like, you're going to run across these types of things at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, when did that start to kind of become like the main thing? So when I, I, I actually moved back to the town where my grandfather lived that I took care of him. That was uh, Hopewell, New Jersey, which is kind of right outside of Princeton area. Nice yeah. in the mountain, mountain, semi-mountainous area, if you want to call it mountainous. Um, hilly. Yeah, hilly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sourland, <laughs> Sourland Hills. Yeah. Um, that's going to piss a lot of people off. Uh, <laughs> Sourland Hills. Um, it kind of took a turn when I, when I was living on my own. And I learned that I could take cheap ingredients and, you know, when you moved to your first apartment and like, it's like you pay your rent and you're like, oh, cool. That's yeah. all I got left for right. two whole weeks. What yeah. do I do? And <laughs> you got to stretch this shit. I learned how to, one of the first things I, when I, I made that I thought was like chefy was yeah. when I was uh, probably uh, early twenties, you're going back, you know, 10, 10, 12 years. I, uh, I made ramen noodles and I drained off the the soup part and I like sauteed the noodles with Ooh, like some dog. walnuts and a little chicken. Wow. And I made my own duck sauce and I like found out how easy that was to do. I was like, this costs like four bucks. Yeah. All together. Right. You know, back when chicken was not the price of an Aston Martin. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I was like, wow, this is cool. What else could I do? How else could I make food? Like to buy bacon wrapped scallops, you're going to pay 30, 40 bucks for a couple of them. Right. If you buy bay scallops from the grocery store and your own bacon and wrap them yourself, you can cook them how you like. You can you can do so much with creativity and yeah. having to work on a budget. Um, that's what transformed me into the magic of cast iron because I figured out that everything you cook on cast iron is a better for you. Yeah, but b this just makes it better. It's it's just tastes better. Yeah, it is better and it's cool because it's old. If you're cooking on something that's you know some of these things here hundred years old. Right, and uh, I just became fascinated. It was probably 12 years ago, I would say would be the exact point in time where I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. You start this metamorphosis yeah. to cast iron. Kind yeah. Of. Yes. Um, is, yeah. Yeah. So my cocoon was building. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, springs forth a butterfly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you've mentioned a couple of times and this is questions out of order, but I don't Dogger. care. So why, like you said, some of these things could be a hundred yeah. plus years old. Yeah. Why is cooking on something that's so old, healthier, than cooking on something that's like brand new from the store. Well, back then when they made the pans, it was mostly from pure iron ore. Like they mined it from the mountains. Most of these brands, 90% of the brands of cast iron, vintage cast iron, come from either Ohio or Pennsylvania. And it's Western Pennsylvania. You're yeah. talking Erie and and Eastern Ohio, you sure. know. And it was raw iron. It was made correctly. I'm a machinist by trade and I can see how these pans were made and milled and, and tooled and, and made with love and care. Now it's a it's a quantity thing yeah. versus actually putting out a good product. Things are made nowadays to be replaced. Right. It's no it's no secret to anybody that it's really hard to find a good, well-made product nowadays that doesn't have some sort of warranty that immediately goes away yeah. a second it's a year old or something, you know. Right. So Back then, they didn't have the option to do that very much. So they had to make good things. They didn't have the money back then and the time and the the means to go and shop and go and buy. And if you bought something, it was meant to last. Right. So the quality's there. The craftsmanship is there. And most of the iron nowadays, I can't speak for the new cast iron brands. I don't know if it's for sure, but it's very hard to think that a pan's gonna a company's gonna put out a million pans of raw ore iron. You'd think some of it's recycled. Sure. And that just gets in your head. 
to me, you know, think you're, you know, somebody's recycled fishing lures or something, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> so it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say psychological, but it's just, it's logic based. Things right. were made better back then. It's the reason you'd want a 69 Camaro versus a 96 Camaro. Of course. I, yeah. 96 Camaro was cool. Totally. I totally would have wanted a 69 Camaro. Though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. I have a new truck. Would love an old truck. Absolutely. You know? What a Chevy Ford Dodge, what is it? Uh, Ford. Okay, cool. You'd probably want an F100 from the 60s. 100%. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's I, same. I have this dream from one day when this show actually becomes like a mega success. Because <laughs> we're at like huge success right now. So like mega success. Yeah, yeah. Where I have like all this disposable income where I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to buy a truck. Yeah. Like an old truck. Yeah. And like. We'll make sure it has an automatic trim. I'm with you on the because, disposable income. Yeah, <laughs> that would be really feel cool. that, man. Yeah. Um, okay, so you start going down this path of uh, getting into cast iron and, and all that kind of stuff. You have the background of being a hustler and picking, mm -hmm. you know, antiquing, all that kind of stuff. So I'm curious to know, like, at what point do you decide, like, hey, I should put this stuff on social media because people give a shit about what I'm doing hmm. or just kind of like, starting out and like doing your own thing and starting to try to it, it, when, when at one point maybe did you think of it as like i can make this a business and start learning how to Ooh. restore these things that's a better question to start with well it was there was a there was a couple different stages of it i i loved sharing the videos of the cooking and stuff and helping people learn to cook it's very cool when somebody says hey i made that that uh those the steaks the way you like i like reverse searing yeah when people say hey i tried reverse searing i'm never going to cook a steak the other way Again, right. That's inspiring when somebody says, Hey, I learned from your recipe. So pushing the recipes and growing the recipes, that person shares it with this person, with this person, with that person. That's all cool. That's part of the growth in the social media part. But the business end came from, um, certain chefs started reaching out. Um, some people that are actually like pretty, pretty well known in the food world were getting cast iron from me and saying, Hey, the way that you're restoring these and the way that you're seasoning them and taking care of them working pretty good for us. Like we don't have any problems with it. Like, do you have another size, this size that people are buying sets? I'm putting, you know, I'm curating for people, brands, yeah. like certain people want to grow brands. Um, you know, just, just the level of, um, uh, culinary professionals that were actually reaching out for skillets. Sure. And I think that that personal touch I was talking about kind of made the difference. Yeah. Uh, because they're like, all right, he's just a knock around guy that, you know, does this right. So, yeah. Uh, the business end came when I think the pandemic, which I hate talking about the pandemic cause it just, it's just so hard to avoid it, but people were cooped up. Yeah. People were cooking at home a lot more. I don't know if you remember, but if you tried to get DoorDash during the pandemic, you had like a three hour wait totally. And it was inflated prices. There was, there was, you know, you had to pay extra for delivery fees. You felt guilty tipping them because they're working during the pandemic. It was just an explosion of cost. Yeah. And, um, people were cooking at home more. And including myself. And uh, I reached out to a couple chefs and said, hey, I have some cast iron if you want to, if you need anything, you know. And a couple chefs reached out and said, yeah, we, we're looking for this, that, that, that. And I asked them for the first time ever, I was like, I'll sell you these for a cheaper price if you post that I'm doing this. Sure. Because I still had a way to get them during any pandemic, during anything, I can always get these. I've worked with these pickers for like 10 years. Like yeah. they're the same guys I've always done work with. Um, but the chef's sharing like, Hey, this guy is the guy I get my cast iron from that boomed it into a business. I went from selling maybe 30 or 40 a year and thinking that was cool. To yeah. Hundreds. Right. And that, that confidence and, um, you know, certain chefs, uh, like, like Maddie Matheson and, and Brad Leone, like those guys were very pivotal to making me feel like I was doing the right thing and that I could keep going yeah. with, with it as a business, as well as a passion. Sure. So did it, so you, I, I was, the, my next question was going to be like kind of pivotal moments. You just talked about it, but yeah, very pivotal. Yeah. So let's, you know, you talk about Maddie Madison and, and Brad Leone and some of these other guys that are, that are following you and you're now yeah. doing work with. Um, and you said you go on from doing like 20, 30, uh, pans a year to hundreds. Yeah. Like that's a pretty big jump. It was a very big jump. For it was a one lot. guy. Yes. Yeah. Was there like almost kind of like a oh shit, like this is getting too big too fast type of thing? Like because obviously, like at the same time, like if you're, you know, promoting this business that you've now built yourself, which is mm -hmm. incredible, and like I respect 
the hell out of that. Hey, thank you. But then also at the same time, like you need to make sure that like your quality is staying yeah, I'm not where it needs to be. Don't want to get them going right. underwater. There's like some shitty pan and just to get it out the door. I mean, one of the catalysts for absolute growth, I have to, I have to say was, um, Right when my, my grandmother passed away, the grandmother that I'm talking about, right. that was 2020, uh, right right in the middle of the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, that sucks. She always had my great-grandmother's cast iron skillet from 1916, I believe it was made. It's a very early Griswold uh, slant logo for those of you watching that know your Griswolds. Um, she told me that that's – she asked me, I, I'm getting old. Is there anything in my house that you would want? And I yeah. was like, I just literally want that. And she said, I can't give that to you right now. There's too many people that might want it in the family. Too many people are going to give me shit for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So she uh, she said, if I ever feel like I'm getting sick or I ever feel like I'm not going to come home, I will make sure before I leave for whatever procedure or whatever hospital visit I, or I'll have somebody come and put it, it'll be in the oven when it's ready to be yours. And she passed away. We had her services and her, her celebration of life actually at her house. And I told my aunt... And my dad, who were kind of handling all the, you know, the, yeah. the, the fun side of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, I told them the story and they said, well, go look in the oven. Is it in there? And it was in there. Wow. And like two weeks later, I connected with Brad and it was like the universe said, dude, just like yeah. that, that Philly shove that they all talk about. That sure. was the universe saying, yeah. you know, they were shoving me. She shoved me right into yeah. it. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. It just, yeah. Cause like, to me, that's like the big thing is <clears throat> obviously like, you know, you have all these things happening. And then, like, the universe gives you, like, that push. It was a total sign. And then, but also at the same time, like, scaling it the right way to make sure that you're, yeah. you know, kind of... I just went with it. Whatever yeah. came at me, I, I took as a, this is supposed to happen kind of thing. Sure. I yeah. kind of, before that, had that not happened, I might have been like, whoa, 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 what are we doing here? But after that, I said, you know what? I just have to take this on full-fledged. I would, I would get stacks of skillets, as many as I could, restore as many as I could, and I would do what was called table sales. I would literally clear off the table. I would lay out the skillets. I would flip them over so the backs were facing up so you could see the brands. Full table sales. I'm talking 30, 40 skillets. And I would post the picture. I'd have a notebook going, ready to go. You know, my girlfriend was ready there with, with the notebook too. And I would fire off the picture of the table sale and the DMs would just start shooting in. I remember my first sale I ever did. I, I, I said, I'm just going to post everything I have and see what happens. Yeah. The birth of the table sale. And it was like... It was like 30, it was between 30, 40 pans and I was sold out in less than an hour. That's crazy. I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like this is nuts. So I tried to find better products. I tried to figure out what sold faster, try to get more of that. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. sold towards the end that I, I kind of like package deal things too. Like if a skillet's left and there's, you know, one or two, I'll say, Hey, listen for, you know, another 40, 50 bucks, I'll throw these in, I'll pay, I'll do shipping. I'll pay. Like I'm very... I enjoy the marketing end of it and yeah. like the, the sales end of it too. But then the people, that's awesome that this, this one wound up being better than this one. Yeah. And that's the one I didn't even want. Yeah. So learning the marketing was definitely a big part of the growth and, and the inspiration to say, Hey, what, what else could I do? Right. And it gave me the confidence that I can handle it. Yeah. And I've been keeping it at that scale ever since that's I'll awesome. post six to eight at a time. Last year I did a huge Christmas sale where I did, you pay a flat fee and you get any random piece that's on this table. They valued from one hundred fifty dollars to you know a couple hundred dollars, and like it was like thir no, again thirty forty pieces. It was sold out in less than an hour. Yeah. So I'm like, if I can keep it this way, that'll be good. So now at its current state, I do a handful of pans, and every other sale besides that post is people messaging me just telling me what they need. So it's all like it's it's word of mouth. Yeah, is really what it all is. That's really cool. Yeah. So the digital version of word of mouth, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> DM the of mouth. Word of yeah. DM. Word of DM. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we break, I, I do want to ask one more question. So like you have all these things happening, and like obviously like there's significant growth, and like now you're working with you know like chefs that maybe like you've watched on TV only before Dude, that. Oh yeah. Like. Do you still get those like pinch me moments? Like, oh shit, I, I'm now talking to this person. Yeah, there was a few of them. Um, big one. I was I was on a walk when I lived in Bordentown City for a little while, which is another great place in New Jersey. Um, and I had a friend who's he's kind of kind of a friend, kind of just like a guy that was always like really messaging me on Instagram, and like I connected with the guy, lo loved the guy, 
talked talk shop on recipes and fun tweaks and recipes and stuff. He goes, hey, man, I don't know what you're doing right now, but Gordon Ramsay just started following you. He's like, me and my girl just saw it. Like, we we saw that you were mutual, like, followers. Like, yeah. I was like, wait, what? No way. And I remember stopping and sitting down. There was a bench. Again, the universe. universe in a way. <laughs> I, I looked at, I went, no way. It's probably a fake account. Sure. You know what yeah. I mean? There's no way. Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, Ramsay <laughs> won. <laughs> underscore. And I, t- I would look at my phone. I'm like, oh, my God, there's no way. And I turn. There's just this big open bench. There's people everywhere. Yeah. Or down city. There's a bench right there. I, I literally sat down and I looked and I was like, this is, I, I, what the hell? Yeah. That's a pinch me moment. Right. Because he's, you know, obviously that's, sure. that's like the med, that's the guy. Yeah. And for that to happen organically, 100% organically, sent me a pretty good message of, you know, hey. Yeah. I think you might be doing it, doing it right. Sure. So. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to take a quick break. Cool. Uh, we're going to talk in, about some of these ones that we have in the back. We're going to talk a little bit more about like the process cool. uh, in the second segment. Um, but this was a great kickoff to kind of like all the ways that you got started with this whole thing. Um, awesome. I have so many more questions already. But uh, so this is the Green Speed Garden State Podcast. I'm Mike Cam. Green Speed Garden State Podcast powered by the New Jersey Lottery. Sorry, Lottery. Uh, I'm Mike Cam. We're here in Trent, New Jersey with Cast Iron Kyle. We'll be right back. The Mayo Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. Hey, folks. I want to tell you about the crew over at Make Cool Shit. These are the magicians who recently gave our podcast a jaw-dropping makeover. You know how we roll here at Greetings of the Garden State Podcast, right? We're all about that Garden State attitude. Well, Make Cool Shit shares that same vibe, and they've got something absolutely epic to offer. It's called the Unlimited Cool Shit Design Subscription. It's a game changer, my friends. Imagine this, unlimited creativity, one flat monthly fee, and none of that boring stuff. It's like having your very own army of design superheroes on speed dial. Whether you're a fresh race startup or a seasoned business looking to shake things up, the team at Make Cool Shit has got your back. It's all about making your brand sizzle, no matter where you are in your journey. So if you're ready to turn your ideas into mind-blowing realities, then it's time to connect with Make Cool Shit. To check them out on Instagram at at WeMakeCoolShit or visit their website, WeMakeCoolShit.co. Remember, that's co, not com. Greetings from the Garden State is proud to be partnered with some amazing brands. A special thanks to LeGrand Coffee House, our official coffee, and Birdling, our official travel bag. To learn more about these and all of our other great sponsors, head to GreetingsFromTheGardenState.com. All right, we're back for segment two of this episode of Greens for the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. We're in Trenton, New Jersey with Cast Iron Kyle, Kyle Sipe. So in the first segment, we learned your background, hustler, young Kyle, leads all the way to now yes. selling cast iron skillets and cows and pigs back here. <laughs> so this one I saw has been getting like a lot of attention on social media. Yes. So can we like talk about it? Yeah. Fast? Um, I found it at a Goodwill. Uh, wow. Of all places, yeah. Which I usually strike out with uh, finding vintage cast iron, mm-hmm. but it's always worth a stop, you know. And uh, I grabbed it. I said, ah, "This would be cool." Because sometimes I'll see pieces that I'm like, "This might not be a good sales piece." Sure, but I could definitely get some content behind it. Like I could definitely generate some cool content with this, which is part of you know half the battle is getting people there. Yeah. And uh, I restored it. I, I put it in an electrolysis tank. Got it all. You know, this thing was completely a rust bomb. Yeah. Um, when I first shared the video, uh, it was uh, all rusted up. And it has, it's actually got three pieces. There's a gr- um, The top part comes off. There's a little grate inside so that the coals aren't on the very bottom. And then the cow itself. Yeah. So I had three tanks go and restoring it. And, um, yeah, the, it's it's so funny. Like, the simplest video is just like, oh, yeah, hey, check this out. It's Three million. And I do, like, a French lamb rack, and it's, like, 10,000. Yeah. Damn. This is like some, it's the wildest You're thing. You're not that good. Yeah, <laughs> they exactly. They want the cow. They want the cow. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, what is, what, what's the universe telling me now, you know? So it did get quite a bit of attention. I get yeah. a lot of messages about it. I've yeah. gotten quite a few people that think it's for sale. Sure. And um, anytime I post any content with this or the pig, it's just... It's just cool because you know I've never seen either of these before. Yeah, these are the one versions of them I have. Right, they're not particularly valuable. They're not particularly old. They're just different and yeah. fun. So I've done some content on both of them. I actually brought this one up to Maine 
and did some elk on it and just, you know, we've got this cool Airbnb on a lake up in Maine. I was like, I'm bringing the cowgirl. Yeah. You know, driving down the highway, going to Maine, I hear clanking in the back. I'm like, there she is. She's with us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a, it's an interesting piece and, um, probably the one that's gotten the most attention. So I figured, you know, it could hang out with us. Yeah, totally. So what I find really interesting is like, as we're talking about like these skillets and, you know, all the pans and everything that we have out, yeah. like this one that's on top, like obviously something that like looks like this or looks like this, right. There's like that, like another level of detail into like crafting something like that, which is mind blowing in and of itself. Yes. I feel like, yes. Um, the process of actually making these things is literally just melting. It's, it's cast iron. It's melted yeah. iron. And a lot of the older companies like Wagner, Griswold, Erie, Wapak, all those ones that you'll see mentioned on my page, um, it's all, it's a lot of sand molds. They would literally mo make a mold out of sand for yeah. what they would want. They would cast it and then they would hone, they would hone that model down to a little bit closer of what they want, make a sand mold of that until they eventually got something that had, you know, perfect, perfect edges, you know, the same, uh, you know, thickness here and there and, and stuff like that. So the process of making them is the reason that they're, they're awesome, but it's also why it's kind of easier to restore the older stuff because yeah. of how well made it is. It's, right. it's harder to restore the newer pieces because it's not made as well. Yeah. So, so talk about processes, processes. <laughs> I want to know a little bit more about your process. Mm. So obviously like the first step is going and like finding these. Yeah. So you mentioned like you found the cow at Goodwill, which is kind of rare, Very but rare. like what other places are you going to like find these? And then, mm. Once you're there, what are you looking for? That's that's a very good question. So throughout the years of doing this, I've ventured to many of the New Jersey-centric flea markets. Yep. Um, you have all the ones in Central Jersey at Columbus and Gold Nugget and all that stuff. And throughout the last decade, um, New Egypt flea market as well, too. Throughout the last decade, I've been buying this stuff, and I'm not beating up anybody on prices. They post ten bucks on a skillet. I know I can restore it and sell it for more. I'm gonna pay the ten bucks. I'm not. I understand uh, the 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 process of of making it up in volume. I'd rather sell ten pans yeah. for a five dollar profit than try to make twenty dollars profit on one pan. Sure, because you're gonna have to find a new customer every time you have to sell that expensive pan. Yeah, but the people that want to get it as a gift, that want to buy another one, there will always come if your price is just a little bit lower than the next guy. Mm -hmm. So, I've had to go to these flea markets and get them from these people, but I'm also honest with my prices for them because I know that the markup I'm gonna have on it. Right, but. If it's in really terrible shape and it's rusted and it's got all this crud on it and corrosion, I do kind of sometimes if I know a pan's going to take a couple hours of restoration, I'll say, hey, can you knock like five, ten bucks off of this? But I have a good reputation of paying very close to, if not exactly what these people want. So I have derived a complete client list of, well, not client, a reverse client, um, vendor list, sourcing list, yeah, vendor yeah. of people that hold this stuff for me. Sure. People that message me a stack and say, hey, before I go to the flea market, Here's what I got. Are you interested in any of this? And yeah. I will literally screenshot the photo, circle, 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 this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, sell that one. I'll go look at it, make sure it doesn't, it's not bent or bowed or cracked or anything. All of my prices through the phone are a quote of, if it is in good shape, sure. this is what I will pay. On, yeah. um, and I do, I'm proud, very proud to say I have the reputation of paying very well for the skillets. And I, I help these people out by paying and not beating them up. Sure. So there's, there's guys that don't even bring this stuff to the market anymore because they know they can make their money with me. Yeah. So you mentioned like cracked, dinged up, whatever. Yeah. Is there ever like a cast iron pan that's like so far gone that's like mm -hmm. just like so rusted out? Like you mentioned the cow was like a basically like a rust bucket right. before this. Does that ever happen? There is. There are pans that have sat out, you know, so long and gotten rusted where they do get some pitting in them. But uh, if you're well seasoned, which is a great term to use, if yep. you're well seasoned in cast iron, the pitting won't really affect much. They're kind of like traps for more seasoning. Sure. Um, so like the, the one pan I use for uh, when I do good expensive steaks, it the, it's literally all pitted up in here and it doesn't really change much. Yeah. Um, but there are pans. If it's cracked, you can't fix it. it right. I mean, you can. It's it's never going to be perfect. It kind of puts equal or un unequal opposite pressure on the rest of the pan when you weld it because of how porous the nature of this this piece is. Yeah. Um, it, it's not really repairable. 
And there are some guys that turn them into spatulas, but I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know about a five pound sca- spatula, but they're pretty cool. They are yeah. cool. The guys that are it doing it is cool. It is yeah. cool. It's neat. It's like if you're in the cast iron, get the cast iron spatula. I get it, but I, I can't do that. No, nah, we want uh, yeah. easy yeah. on the wrist, um, you know? But the cracked ones, I do move them to some guys that make the spatulas out of them. Yeah. And uh, rust, rust really isn't a big issue because it's, as long as it's not penetrated rust, like it's deep inside the skillet, it's very, it's, it's fixable. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So you, you're uh, sourcing spots. Mm-hmm. Now you got your pants. Yep. What's the next step? What are you doing? So there's an analysis process I like to use. It's a three-stage analysis process. You either have one that needs rust and restoration, one that's just rusted, or ones that are ready to go. So if a skillet has a lot of crud and corrosion on it, or not corrosion, but like built up stuff, you know, because they cooked over fire stoves back in the day. Sure. You know. Yeah. It's going to need to be either done through process of electrolysis or lye. And then after that, I do a vinegar bath. So that alleviates all any rust that's left. Gotcha. Um, some guys do it the other way around. I find that it doesn't really matter which which direction you go. You could either do the lye bath first, the rust next, which rust is easy to remove. It's, it's one part vinegar to one part water. Use a gallon of water, use a gallon of vinegar, let it sit for a couple hours, takes care of the rust. All wow. natural. Yeah. Try to be as natural as, pro- as possible with this process. I don't really use lye baths very much. Um, electrolysis is really the way to go because that can remove both um, built-on stuff yeah. and the rust at the same time. Interesting. So if it's just rusty, you could just give it a little vinegar bath, good to go. Yeah. Sometimes I get skillets that are turnkey. I just reseason them, get them to bare metal, reseason them, ready to go. Yeah. How'd you figure this shit out? Uh, a lot of other guys that okay. are doing it. And I also... There is a lot of trial and error because the way one guy does something doesn't necessarily work for another guy. Yeah. Um, It's not cut and dry as much as saying like, well, a cup of this and two scoops of that and four scoops. I'm I'm doing it in 55 gallon drums. So I got to figure out my ratios. Um, There's also things like food, food safe things that you can add to electrolysis that kind of boosts the process. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, being a machinist, I kind of learned like the composition of metal a little bit different. I kind of have that in sure. Just like I have that. Yeah. Just a feather in my cap as far as starting. Yeah. From, what am I working with? Right. And, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, you're developing your own process. There's a way to do things, but you got to figure out your way. Yeah. You know, what can make it faster, but if it's faster, is it going to be good? If it's good, can it be fast? Can we get a skillet out in a day? Can we yeah. get a skillet out in three days? Um, the one thing I do implement, though, is when I'm shipping, because this is my side gig. I don't let this interfere with my main um, gig. I do give like a seven to 10 day window on shipments just because I don't like to rush shipping yeah. these because of how brittle they are and how easily they are to break. The last thing I want to do is rush shipping something that's 100 years old. Sure. And have someone message me and say, dude, this cracked. Yeah, I've sold. If I, I couldn't even put a number on how many I've sold, but I have had less than a dozen breaks in all the years I've been doing cast iron. Yeah. And that to me is more important than the money, more important than almost anything other than my family's background in this. Yeah. That is the most important thing to me is just getting these skillets safe to people. Yeah. I've shipped them to Europe. I, I mean, London, I've done, uh, I just did Ireland. I've done Scotland. I've done Spain, every state, all 50 states. That was a fun milestone. Yeah. Um, New Jersey being the most important of those 50 states. Of course. Uh, all parts of Canada, South America, and I have had no breaks on the uh, international shipments. Sure. Most of my breaks are in the Northeast, and it's nuts. Like Boston, three breaks in Boston, two in New York. Mass holes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's always around the holidays. Well, right. Colder, I would imagine. People, well, not only that, people are just rushing. They're not putting thought into it. So that's just as important as the process of restoring, because if you can't get the pan there safe, it doesn't matter how you restore it. Right. So it goes back to what we were talking about in the first segment about just like your reputation, like the quality of it. (laughs) All of it's riding on that. Yeah. Yeah. They're safe. I'm also big into taking the hit as a as a business, adding the insurance on everything I sell, I build that into the quote Sure, based on where you live. Um, the insurance is awesome because the buyer gets their, their money back and they have the opportunity to get a, a second piece yeah. at no cost to them. 
Um, you see a lot of people that sell always want you to do like friends and family on PayPal and Venmo. Yeah, yeah. You're not protected that way. Right. So what I do is I give you the insurance, like the, the tracking number with the insurance built in and the reputation of it getting there safe is just as important. Like, yeah. like I just mentioned. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, uh, back to picking them. What are the brands okay. that are like, you need, like, if, let's just say someone's like, oh, dope. Like, I want to go find yeah, yeah. one, you yeah. know, and then I'll send it to Kyle and he can restore it for me. Yes. And send it back. Which I love doing, by the way. If anybody has anything in these are yeah. stored, I so, love doing that. What are the, what, what are ones that people like should be looking out for? So, uh, Griswold. Okay. Griswold's a good one. That All right. Pretty tore up. Good. Griswold. Mm -hmm. There's some Wagners in there. Griswold, Wagner, um, Wapak. Uh, before Griswold was Griswold, they they went by Erie brand. So okay. if you see the brand, Erie's good. That definitely old. It's definitely 110 years old plus. That's pretty wild. Like they're the youngest one is 110 years old. Yeah. You're talking, you know, 1890s on some of those. Sure. Uh, yeah. Erie, Wapak, Wagner. Um, Wagner did. Um, dissolved Griswold in the fifties and they did start making some like lesser quality pans in the fifties and sixties. Uh, so just because it says Wagner, I don't want people to think that it's, you know, one of the valuable ones. Um, always send me a picture. If you're thinking about buying a skillet and you're in the, in the wild looking at them, send me a picture. I can tell you if it's a good one or not. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you what to look for. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're getting a Griswold, you're not going to go wrong. Um, anything that says Erie, anything that says Wapak, Favorite, Pequa, um, there's a brand Volrath, but it usually just has a little number with a line on the back and it's usually like at 90 degrees on the skillet. That's a great brand. Anybody, I get that picture a lot. Like this has no brand on it. What yeah, is yeah. it? I was like, dude, grab that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Take it. Get it. Yeah. Um, there's some other lesser known brands. You have like Martin. That was one of the rare brands that was in, uh, Alabama okay. back in the, you know, early 1900s. There's yeah. a few foundries down there. Um, and a few in, uh, Illinois, Chicago, there's a, a brand called uh, Chicago hardware foundry and O'Brien and O'Brien, they were in business for like 10 years in the, in the 1920s. So yeah. anything, any of those brands will be perfect. For sure. You. So I feel like, so I'm a lay person, right? Not, not a, I mean, I like to cook, do mm -hmm. some like barbecue stuff. I have a smoker. That's kind of like where it starts and stops for me. Okay. I was saying about Chrissy, she like culinary school, the whole deal. Right. All she cooks on really is cast iron. Yeah. She likes it because the kitchen that she's in right now, which will be like, this will be like the last day she cooks in the kitchen when this episode comes out because we're moving. Mm -hmm. But like her kitchen's like lopsided. Her stove is kind of lopsided. It's like the only thing that can really get it heated up evenly yeah. is a cast yeah. iron skillet or like a lake cruise or stuff like that. Right, so right. I feel like one of the things that Someone like me who had one for a long time and it was just like a campfire, or whatever the hell yeah. Yeah, from Target. Like it's like a, you know, what you were talking about before. One that just like kind of like a mass produced type one, but still, still technically a cast iron skillet. It has the properties and the, the, um, the cool part of cast sure. iron. You know what I mean? Like, but like I never used it because okay. I was like intimidated by it because I was like, don't be I a, don't know how to clean this thing. Right. I don't know really exactly how to cook it. Like, I know you could, like, you know, you could watch Gordon Ramsay, like, throw some fucking rosemary and a steak in there and, like, <laughs> put a bunch of butter on it and then throw it in the oven. It comes out. I'm setting off smoke alarms right, and all sorts of right, stuff. Right. Um, so maybe, like, kind of take us, take the person, that the novice, okay. through kind of, like, the basics of caring for mm. and cooking with a cast iron skillet. Okay. So the first thing, the first piece of advice I give anybody, I get that question very often. Mm. Uh, the first thing I would tell you to do is to just forget everything that you've learned up to this point. There is 90% of the problems people have with cast iron is because it's, you're overthinking. It's very simple. You need oil and you need heat. You need high heat. If you put this skillet on your stove cold and you crack an egg in it and it heats up with the skillet at the same time, it's going to stick. If you put this on your stove and heat it up almost as hot as it'll go, put a little oil in it. Put that egg in there and immediately start moving the egg. You will create this this chemical scientific. I'm not. I'm. I have no idea what it would be called. Yeah. It's a. It, it immediately releases and you have this barrier of movement so that nothing will stick. Turn the heat down. You can cover it if you want for a little bit so you don't get that smoke. But a lot of people keep the heat going and this will absorb all that heat. Yeah. All that heat. So get it where you're. <clears throat> You're able to sear something, give it a good sear, immediately crank the heat down, but get it moving. 
um, steaks you would wait or any meat you would want to wait a little bit longer. Sure. I like to say, one of the phrases I like to use is the, the meat will tell you when it's ready to be lifted because a steak will stick if it's not ready to turn. If okay. you don't get that Maillard reaction where you get that crust on the steak, it's not going to lift and you're going to have portions of it that are sticking. Yeah. So it's a lot of patience, but it's, it's, it's temperature control and it's using the right oils. You want to use the oil with a high smoke point, which would be like your avocado oils or your animal fats. I use predominantly animal fats in my personal skillets. When I'm doing a skillet for a customer, I always use avocado because I'm not sure. I'm never sure who's vegan, who's yeah. not. I know avocado is safe for everybody. Right. There's no allergies attached to it. Um, but you need a good oil. You need temperature control. And it's it's weird. I get DMs from people that are like, I just unlocked it. I figured it out. Yeah. Like I figured out that sweet spot and it was 10 times more simple than what I was trying to do before. Yeah. It's, it's just keeping it simple and don't overthink it. Um, as far as restoring them, send it to me. Yeah. Super easy. Don't even bother. Done. <laughs> send, it, send them here. You seal it, stamp it. <laughs> you got a guy now. Get the mailman. Um, but for <laughs> caring, uh, caring for it in a sense of like, okay, I cooked this baller steak in it. Good. Came out great. Now what do I do with it? All right. You got two, two scenarios. One, sure. it looks like this and the steak came out fine. Skillet looks nice and smooth. Let it cool down. Don't ever do this in the sink when it's hot because you will warp the metal. You'll crack the metal. Yeah. It'd be dangerous. Could steam, burn you. Let it cool down a little bit. Get a little water in there. Wipe it out with your paper towel. If it looks dry, put a little oil in there. Run your paper towel around it. Put it back on your stove. Let the flame come up. As long as it's, you know, 165 to 200 degrees, you're going to kill any germs. Yeah. Um, and you're ready to go next time. If you do have things stick, which happens time to time, none of these are to the point where you can cook anything in them and nothing's going to stick. Yeah. I mean, I have a few pans where I would be challenged to have something stick to it. I'm proud to say I've gotten them to that point. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't need this to add any oil to cook eggs or steaks or anything like that. But if you do have something that sticks, take a little steel wool, loosen it up. Rinse it out. Once again, let the pan cool down. Rinse it out. Wipe it out. Oil, heat, done. That's the big, big uh, controversy in cast iron is sure. soap or not. Soap's fine. Uh, the oil bonding to the pan, that's polymerization. That's a scientific bond of that oil breaking down and the bonding to the, to the, the atoms yeah. of the steel. Sure. Or the, the iron. So much science with this stuff. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But it, that's the part that's overwhelming to people. Right. And but if you they think about it. From. Yeah. yeah. It's just big words. Yeah. Exactly. Polymerization means just good burned oil stuck on. Yeah. Good. Goes polymerization means that. good. That's it. There you go. In the dictionary. <laughs> Webster's it. Um, <laughs> polymerization good. Yeah. So if you we'll have anything that sticks. This episode. There you go. Polymerization equals good. Yeah. Um, the controversy of soap. Um, I like the pan to look. See how these pans have a little element of shininess to them. There's yeah. A little bit of surface oil. Yep. Any kind of soap. Modern old st old soap, I know I get a lot of messages of people say, well, that's because soap had lye in it back in the day. I'm like, well, now I use lye to restore the skillets. You sure. don't want that near your, your pan. Now we have modern degreasers. Any soap that you have in your kitchen or your house has a degreasing chemical in it, has some sort, even if it's a natural soap, it's still a degreasing agent. You don't, it, you don't need it. There's yeah. no need for it. Some people mentally say, you know what, I'm not going to feel safe about cooking on this unless I use soap. Clean and it. if that's the case... Fine, you're going to have a harder time getting your skillet to the point where you can cook just about anything in it. But if that's your forte, that's fine. Um, I find, like like I mentioned, uh, I was in Boy Scouts. I learned that if you want to purify or sanitize anything, all you need is a heat is, is heat above yeah. 200 degrees is going to kill any germs. You boil water, you get water out of the gutter in the street, boil it, let it cool down, and it's safe. Yeah, I wouldn't do that, but sure, it's science. Yeah, right. And I find often that the people that use the science of polymerization saying, well, soap's not going to damage the polymerization, so what's the difference if we use soap? I'm like, well, then why would you even use it? Yeah. That's the thing. I want, I'm not saying you can't. If you, if you want to, that's cool. My thing is it's it's completely unnecessary sure. if you have a well-seasoned skillet. Yeah, I feel like all that stuff, the, way, the more you talk about it, like all that stuff and knowing that I use soap to clean it because I don't know. But when well, that like <laughs> rips rips off all that like good seasoning that you've kind of done outside of it, yes. sure, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the bonded stuff, it's not gonna yeah change that. So right. I find the people that try to use science against me are the same people that deny the other end of the science, saying like, "Hey, I just wipe it out and and heat it up, yeah, and it's sanitary, right? I'm not losing any oil, 
And the average, the average person, there was, a, I, I did a study on how much it took, the least amount of water it took to get soap off of a skillet to the point where there's no soap residue or any remnants of soap was between five to seven gallons of water. Wow. So if you use your skillet half, half the nights of the year, say yeah. you use it, you know, 180 nights of the year, you're talking five to seven gallons times 180 per pan. You're talking swimming pools of water you're yeah. wasting. That's crazy. And for from one growing, pan. Yeah. From growing yeah. up on the farm, water conservation, we used we used a pond for irrigation. You sure. didn't waste that. You yeah. know what I mean? Just to wash a fucking pan. And that alone to me is enough of a reason not to use it. And I, I don't I don't like people to think that I judge anybody based on soap. And I don't put anybody down. I don't tell them they're wrong. I am incredibly approachable when it comes to anything that has to do with the cast iron. Yeah. But I do want people to know that you don't have to use soap to have a clean, sanitary, well-working cast iron skillet. Right. So. So I love that. And I now I'm a little bit more emboldened in my own adventures mm. with cast iron for the next month until I never have to cook for myself ever again. <laughs> um, Congratulations. Shout out, Chrissy. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what I think is really interesting is like, when we started this episode and we talked about kind of like, I asked you to give me the background or the 30,000 foot view of cast iron Kyle. Right. And now we're here. We kind of like took it all the way through from, you know, like you kind of seeing like what was out there as far as like the cast iron world, mm -hmm. building up your own thing mm -hmm. now working with, you know, interesting people, big names. Um, and then really just kind of taking us through like this second segment has really been kind of just like a basic beginner course on like, how to find one, how to cook with it, how to clean it, like all that kind of stuff. Um, do you feel like you kind of, A, met this, the need that you set out to fill and B, what's next? Like what are, what are, are you like looking to do more stuff uh, in this space or are you kind of like continuing to build out what you have right now? Well, expansion's always a thought, um, hiring somebody, uh, would be the next move, uh, or just, you know, having some help from family and friends and stuff like that. Uh, I do feel like I got out what I needed to get out. That was a nice exhale, both sessions. Very good. Yeah. Um, but that was a lot of, a lot of your part of leading the, the, the questions, which was very well done. Um, thank you. What's not, next? Not many people say that. Well, if you're, you're good, you're, <laughs> I trust you with the wheel here, right? Uh, what's next? I started a hot sauce company. Okay. Um, and I market that. Uh, very differently than other people. Uh, What's the hot sauce called? It's called Word of Mouth Hot Sauce. There's no website. There is no Instagram. We're back to the word of mouth. We love that. Th that's exactly right. I yeah. took the principles of the cast iron business, and I'm very, very, very into the hot sauce world. Yeah. I was the judge for the Boston Hot Sauce Festival. I was one of the judges and creators of the Philadelphia Hot Sauce Festival. Uh, we did one in Jersey, which was Sauce-tober-fest up at Lone Eagle Brewing in Flemington. We yep. started that. And the judging process and the interesting world of craft hot sauce just was so intriguing to me. Um, I got on board with a ton of different companies that wanted to do videos together, do content together. Um, I've now started marketing myself to these hot sauce brands saying, hey, look, I'm giving packages of one sauce, three sauces, and we get together and say, how do you want your sauce represented to people? Yeah. And I found the community to be very inviting. It's not a com competition. Like I have my brand. They're cool with me having my own brand because if I'm at these festivals with them, with my brand, all I'm going to try to do is get more people there for everybody. Yeah. It's, if it's a classic case of it's right. good the for the goose, tides. good for the gander. Yeah. Exactly. Rising tides is going to raise all the yeah. chips. So um, I'm doing a lot of stuff in the hot sauce world. Uh, creating the hot sauce business was really fun, really cool. And I sell that straight through me. And it is at a point where I'm not marketing it at all. It is through this guy set, giving it to his brother-in-law and his yep. brother-in-law's coworkers want a bottle. I'm just seeing where that's, you know, where that's going, marketing it that way. Yeah. Because then, like, I have control with the sales of cast iron. I'm only posting what I can. I'm at the mercy of word of mouth. And eventually that will get to a point. And that sure. might be the person, that might be the next move of hiring somebody to handle that and some of the cast iron sales and stuff yeah. like that. That's cool. So, yeah. Yeah. So take it at, like... Just expanding yeah. on cooking in a cast iron. Yes. But with spicier foods. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yep. Um, all right. So we're out of time, unfortunately. Wow. That was quick. Yeah. We've been going for an hour wow. now, which is pretty wild. But I feel like we can go another couple hours. But 
to be respectful of everyone's time. I'm not bad at talking. I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, it's neither do I. That's why we, well, that's why we both have podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, full yeah. slice podcast. We'll, yeah. we'll shout that out as well. Yeah. Very fun. Um, so if people have listened to this episode and they're like, this is dope. I need to learn more about Kyle. I need to learn more about where I can get mm-hmm. stuff. Like, where would you send them to go learn more? So I do have, um, I have a website that I don't, I don't really plug it very much because I, I want people to come to me to ask because it's very hard to generalize this stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, the questions are usually specific to the situation that their skillet was in before they found it. Right. So there's not really like, here's your product list, but I do have an Amazon uh, affiliate account where people can get the, the stainless steel wool that I use, the oils that I use. Um, that's available. You can do castironkyle.com for that. But what I want people to know is if you're listening to this and you have a question and you think it's a stupid question, it's not a stupid question. Right. I want you to come to me and say, hey, uh, there's like, for instance, to touch on the Wagner question or the Wagner brand. In the 90s, they came out with Wagners, 1891 Wagners. It was a 100th anniversary edition. People think that it's a 100-year-old pan. Yeah. And people are like scared to ask me that. Don't be scared to ask me stuff. Sure. Like, I want to help you. My goal is to educate you how to cook educate you how to find these skillets and then have me restore them for you or teach you how to market them. I do Zoom console, uh, consultations, uh, FaceTime consultations with people by the half hour to two hour gaps where people literally have their collection and say, hey, what do I do with this? Yeah. What should I do with that? Some skillets aren't worth the time to restore them. I want to help people not put three hours of work into a $10 skillet that's sure. you know made in Taiwan in the 60s and they have no idea what's in it and they could get... You know what I mean? I want yeah. people to feel that I'm approachable all on the Instagram, the cast iron Kyle or cast iron underscore Kyle on yep. the Instagram. I want people to be able to come to me and I may not answer you right away, but I'll never ignore you. Sure. The only time I ignore people is when I do a sale. And I say, if I don't answer you back on the availability of a skillet within 24 hours, that means the skillet's gone. I'm not going to ignore the sale posts. Yeah. Um, but I'm also not going to ignore anybody that has a, a question about learning. I, I have grown up around some of the most supportive people in my life. My father, my uncle, um, all of my uncles, my uncle Steve, my uncle Tom, my dad, Henry. Those guys, you could go to them with any question and they would help you with anything. They yeah. never felt, made you feel stupid. They never made you feel like you couldn't come to them with anything. And that just, it, it, that's how I carry myself with this. So come on on. Awesome. Love it. So we'll put the links in the show notes. People cool. can just go click them uh, and learn more, get one, yeah. you know, all I that have, kind of stuff. I have what you're looking for. And if I, yes. if, you have, if I don't have it, I can get it within a couple of days. Sure. Love that. Uh, so they can just go click that. Uh, so we'll put cast iron underscore on Kyle, cast iron underscore Kyle. Uh, this beer is double IPA. <laughs> <laughs> shout out Brick, shout out Brick City. Yeah, Brick um, City. But uh, Cast Iron underscore Kyle is the Instagram. Cast Iron Kyle, Cast Iron Kyle dot com. I'm just gonna like slow myself down. Is the website? So we'll put those in there so you can go click them. Greetings from the Garden State dot com uh, is the website for the show. So you'll look, check out this episode as long as well as all of our other episodes. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much for having me in your home. Thank you for, about all for this having stuff. me on your podcast, yeah. man. This is great. Yeah, this was awesome, and I I'm sure we'll do more stuff uh, together in the future for sure. Absolutely. So. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Green Speak Garden State Podcast, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm Mike Ham. We were here in Trent, New Jersey, with Cast Iron Kyle, Kyle Sipe. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Do you-